Our opening hymn is number 44 in our Trinity hymnal, uh, How Great Thou Art.
God calls us to worship this morning from the 95th Psalm. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all kings. Let us bow our heads in reverence to God. Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, to whom the earth belongs, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, we give thanks to you for your marvelous works and wondrous kindness. When we consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, who are we of whom you would be mindful? We thank you, dear Lord, for being mindful of us. We acknowledge with much gratitude that we are who we are. We have what we have. We do that which we do because of your mindfulness. And now, Lord, we look to you as the Lord of all life, the source of all truth, 
and the fountain of all goodness. As we begin to celebrate the inauguration of our esteemed Governor Henry McMaster, First Lady Peggy McMaster, the First Family of South Carolina, and all of the constitutional officers of the state of South Carolina, we seek your wisdom and divine guidance. As Governor McMaster begins to lead us, dear God, we pray for your continual covering and keeping of him. Grant to him that which you know he needs to serve with integrity and truth, compassion and concern for all. We ask you, Heavenly Father, to instill within his heart and the heart of other state officials fresh confidence in your goodness and the courage to serve with goodwill and honor the truths and the word that comes to us from sacred scripture, those values and godly principles that are ours, so let it be in Jesus' name. Our prayer is to the end that your will is done on earth among us in South Carolina as it is in heaven. This is your servant's prayer in the victorious name of Jesus our Christ. Amen and thank God. Governor, First Lady McMaster, <clears throat> now let us hear the holy word of our Lord found in the Old Testament book of Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land.
Amen. Now let us hear the word of our Lord from the New Testament found in Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, beginning with verse 3. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, let the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. And then in chapter 13, verse 1, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Amen. Thanks be to God for his holy and inerrant word. Governor McMaster, First Lady, Constitutional Officers of the great state of South Carolina, we congratulate you. And on behalf of First Presbyterian Church, uh, we offer you uh, our sincere uh, congratulation and we will be in prayer for you as you serve this great state. Now, uh, Glenn Ward read uh, Romans 13 and verse 1, and I want to read a few more verses from Romans 13, beginning at verse 1. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, Respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Well, thus far, the word of the living God. Now, Paul uh, is writing this epistle uh, to the Romans roughly around 60 AD. Um, when he writes the book of Revelation and and in my view, the book of Revelation was written in the 90s, so th some 30 years later. Um, his view of authority, especially Roman authority, is considerably darker. Uh, he's writing to the Romans when Nero is the emperor. But Nero, although he was a terrible emperor, um, he had not yet done to Christians what he will do uh, in the mid-60s and um, assassinate them. And, and so, at this point in uh, the first century, Christianity is more or less under the protection uh, that Rome afforded um, Judaism. And it, it, 
it, for a season, short season, uh, Christianity was under the sort of protection and umbrella uh, that Rome afforded um, the Jews. Now, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Um, Governor McMaster would not want this text read so as to suggest that you are to obey everything that he says. Um, and this passage needs to be read in conjunction with other passages of Scripture where um, it is right and proper to refuse to obey. One thinks, for example, of the extraordinary courage of Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, in the Second World War in 1945, imprisoned by the Nazis and hanged just days before the Second World War uh, was over. He offered uh, resistance to the brutality uh, of Nazism. You have in the Bible many examples of it. The Hebrew uh, midwives defying uh, Pharaoh and saving the male children, including, of course, Moses. You have Daniel uh, defying um, King Nebuchadnezzar's rule about prayer. You have uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, refusing to bow down to the golden image of Nebuchadnezzar. And then there's Peter and John in the Acts of the Apostles being told not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus, something which they could not possibly agree to. We must obey God rather than men, they said. So when the state is demanding of you what you cannot in good conscience obey, then clearly you must disobey and take the consequences. So Romans 13, 1 needs to be read in the light of other parts of Scripture. So Romans 13.1 is not the whole story. But let's explore this a little, briefly. I've been told to be brief. <laughs> so instead of three points, I'll just have two today. <laughs> and the first thing I want us to see is that there is a God who orders all things. Imagine living in the first century in the 60s, under Nero, a despot. It was a time when society was as unbiblical about moral issues as our current culture is. There's nothing new under the sun. We, we look around and those of us who are my age and, and, and older, um, we can't often believe what's happening in terms of the moral, progressive decline. And some of you are facing it in government and education, for sure. And you have to remind yourself, we have been here before. And it's called the first century. It's called living under Rome, the Roman Empire. There, there were so many difficult things for Christians in the first century. Th things as simple as going to the butcher to purchase a piece of meat for dinner, knowing that an hour before it had been offered up in sacrifice to some pagan deity. What were you to do? How were you to live? Should I pay taxes to the Roman Empire with all that it was doing? And Paul's answer and Jesus' answer was yes. Not as much tax. <laughs> and Governor, you, you have power to set the tax rate. But why should my hard-earned money be going and being used in purposes and events and circumstances that I would not morally agree with. 
It's not a, it's not a new question. It's not a 2023 20, question. It's a question that Paul is addressing. What will Paul's taxes pay for? His own execution. Four years from now, possibly five years from now, as he writes this epistle, his head will be cut off in the name of the Roman Empire. What this passage is trying to do is to say, don't paint yourself into a corner so that your conscience cannot cooperate with civil government unless it is absolutely pure. The only option then would be to adopt what various sects have done and opt out of the political arena altogether. So Paul is saying, take a wider picture here. Things may be bad. But God is in control. There is a God, a God of providence, a God who orders the end from the beginning. Yes, even, even the messy stuff. Understand that he is in charge. The powers that be are ordained by God. God is sovereign. God is in control. That's a wonderful, wonderful thought in evil times, in difficult times, that there is a God who is in charge. We are blessed here in the state of South Carolina to have a governor who believes in God, who believes in the doctrine of providence, that God is in charge. That helps you go to sleep at night. However difficult the road ahead, whatever needs to be done, whatever needs to be changed, whatever the opposition may be, there is a greater power and a greater authority, and it's God. Is there evil in government? Absolutely. But there is good there too. And we must always remember what in Presbyterian world we call the doctrine of common grace. That, that doctrine espoused by the Prime Minister of the Netherlands um, in Abraham Kuyper, uh, we're talking about the 1890s, 1900s, and uh, he espoused a doctrine of common grace. We're grateful, grateful for men like Governor McMaster with Christian convictions involved in the highest echelons of political life. There is a God to whom we must bow and serve. That's the first thing. But then secondly, Paul is suggesting that the goal of good governance is to punish evil and reward good. That's his theme here in Romans 13. And more than that, that good government should encourage good and discourage evil through an effective system of reward and punishment. Now Paul is writing in a context of a Judeo-Christian ethic that clearly knows what is good and what is evil. In our postmodern progressive era, those moral norms have all but been abolished. The Judeo-Christian ethic is under attack. Even amongst our youngest children in our communities, which is why it is vital that Christians should be in the vanguard of political life and children's education. One of the contributions that you can make is to pray, to pray for our leaders, to pray for the governor and his team. 
that they would be led to do what is right, to encourage and reward good and discourage and punish what is evil. Pray for our country. Pray for this great state of South Carolina. I've adopted this state. You can tell I'm not from South Carolina. <laughs> I'm from the motherland, and I still have a passport that bears the name of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Um, but I became a citizen here in South Carolina uh, some eight, or eight years ago, and I've adopted this state. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful state. We intend uh, to retire here and to die here and to be buried here in this great state. But as, as Christians, and, and we are in a church this morning, and this is a prayer service, and as Christians, we are under attack. And it's all too easy to become defensive. And we need to pray. We need to pray that God would rend the heavens and come down. That God would do in the great state of South Carolina what he did in 1740 under the ministry of George Whitfield when hundreds of thousands of men and women and young children had their lives turned around. They came to trust in the Lord Jesus. You can, you can read about what's called the Great Awakening. Hundreds of thousands came to saving faith in Jesus Christ through the ministry of God's Word. And we need to pray that God would do that again. To arrest the decline, to arrest the evil, reward the good. Politics is hard, I'm sure of that. It must be very difficult, very draining, and, and uh, it's, it's an arena of great conflict. But our prayer, Governor, is that God will give you strength every day to do what is right, to never give up, to do it winsomely as, as you are winsome, uh, to do it in a way uh, that promotes um, biblical morals and ethics. So governor, lieutenant governor, secretary of state, state treasurer, attorney general, comptroller general, commissioner of agriculture, superintendent of education elect, our prayers are with you for four years of good and prosperous government here in South Carolina. Work hard to bring about a society where good can prosper and evil is not rewarded. Work to improve South Carolina as much as possible. Pray without ceasing. Surround yourselves as you do with those who can help you achieve good things. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon each one of you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for uh, these men and women who have been elected to public office. And we ask that your blessing would be upon them. Help them every day in difficult circumstances, to do the right thing, to be firm, to, to stand up against the evil in our society, and to promote that which is good. And may they know that underneath are the everlasting arms. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you take your hymnals to hymn number 32, Great is thy faithfulness. <laughs>
Governor, Mrs. McMaster, Lieutenant Governor, Mr. Evett, and all good friends of this great state of South Carolina, good morning. I must warn you, I am as a priest, preacher, pastor, historian, lawyer, and many generations Charlestonian with a microphone, I promise I will have you out by supper time this afternoon. <laughs> <clears throat> Dr. Thomas, I appreciate your three-point preaching methodology that was taught to me by my bishop who ordained me, Bishop David Thompson of Happy Memory, who taught me the three B's of preaching. Those are be prepared, be sincere, and absolutely be seated. So I offer you this prayer this morning that was composed by Bishop John Carroll, who was the first Catholic bishop of the United States in 1790. He was a confidant of Benjamin Franklin. His brother signed the US Constitution. His cousin signed the Declaration of Independence. And he, like so many of us in our great history, had a great love for this country and its democracy. Let us pray. We pray to you, O God of might, wisdom and justice, through whom authority is rightly administered, laws are enacted, and judgment decreed. Let the light of your divine wisdom direct all government leaders and shine forth in all the proceedings and laws framed for our rule in government, that they may tend to the preservation of peace, the promotion of a national happiness, the increase of industry, right judgment, and useful knowledge, and may perpetuate to us the blessing of equal liberty. We pray for our governor, lieutenant governor, and all officers of the state, for the members of the assembly, for all judges, magistrates, and other officers who are appointed to guard our political welfare, that they may be enabled by your powerful protection to discharge the duties of their respective stations with honesty and ability. And we pray for our fellow citizens that we may preserved, be preserved in union and in that peace which the world cannot give. May the blessing of Almighty God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you all and remain with you forever. Amen.